Present. Councillor Kerry? Here. Councillor Lopez? Here. Councillor Sharmer? Here. Councillor Schinkel, is he here? I am. All right. I can't see you. <laughs> Councillor Silvernagel? Here. Mayor Coons? And I am here. Um, I will ask again everyone to call to yourselves, and we will have uh, uh, Councillor Lopez lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God. Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Our typical um, order of business to start tonight is the consent calendar, and then we will follow that up with some reports. We don't have anything on our business agenda this evening, and then we'll go right into a work session on our stormwater utility. Um, Tonight, I would like to welcome um, folks in the room, and we have some online, I see, and let them know that we do entertain comments from the community. They are entertained during the time designated under citizens' comments. If you wish to speak to council, please fill out a comment card and turn it in over at the table near the door. Or if you are online, please open the chat bubble and send a message to Phyllis Bowman. Let her know your name and the topic on which you would like to speak. And she will let me know to call on you as we go through these comments. Speakers comments in this forum are limited to three minutes, but the council welcomes additional information in writing. If you represent a group of people, uh, please indicate that and I would um, entertain that, but I don't see that. I think everyone's put in an individual speaker card tonight. Typically, a speaker's comments are taken under advisement to allow time for the council to review an issue. However, the mayor or councillors may ask for additional information or may convey to the speaker some information that addresses their comment. Um, hopefully, note if you would like to receive follow-up communication, and if so, what avenue is preferred. And we thank you all for your attendance at the Monmouth City Council meeting. Um, and then tonight, also, I will add council comments before we go to the business agenda or to the work session. So we'll have an opportunity for that as well. And we'll start with our consent calendar. We had uh, three meetings um, in the first week of August, the minutes of the regular council meeting of August 4th, the work session of August 4th, and on the 6th, we met again as a group uh, to review our city manager search for the full-time replacement to our interim city manager, and those minutes were in your packet. I would entertain any corrections. Note there did one correction did come out uh, via email today from Phyllis, and so with that correction, entertain a motion on the consent calendar. Move to approve the meeting minutes of those two aforementioned meetings. All right, moved I'll by- second. Okay, thank you. Moved by Councillor Schinkel and seconded by Councillor Silbernagel. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, for my mayor's report tonight, I have uh, two items. One is uh, as aforementioned city manager search. Uh, we began that search in April. Uh, we were unable to complete that due to basically the circumstances we're still all facing with with the uh, pandemic response. And um, we opted to reopen the search. We re-advertise. Um, we are using a search firm, uh, Prothman Company, and 
uh, had a round of candidates that the city council vetted against the same standards. So we hadn't changed anything about the process or anything else um, at this time, but we have invited two candidates to, con to um, come to town and visit us. And so at this time, I would like to announce that the two finalists for the city manager of Monmouth are Martha Marty Wine, who is currently the city manager of Tigard, Oregon, and has been in that position um, for almost nine years. We are also going to meet Steve Dahl. Steve is currently the city administrator of Drain, Oregon. He's been in that position for three years um, with prior experience to that. So we are inviting those two candidates to town next week. Um, typically, we invite the public to join us for a casual meet and greet, a good opportunity to know the uh, people who might help lead the city. And we're not able to do that in the manner in which we usually do. So next week will look a little different. Uh, we have scheduled an, an interview. Um, I, I'm calling it a talk show <laughs> um, that uh, I will be hosting at Western Oregon University on Wednesday afternoon, the 26th. In that interview, I will be meeting with the candidates, um, asking questions that have been submitted by the community as well as um, some of our own. So folks get a chance to at least get to know these people a little bit. That will be live streamed on Woo TV. That's available on the Woo website, wou.edu or on YouTube. Uh, we will actually have that interpreted for the heart of hearing as well, those interviews, but a uh, little bit of a chance. So four o'clock to 4.45 or so and five to 5.45 Wednesday afternoon, they will also be recorded. So we will, uh, people will have an opportunity to uh, watch those and get a, get a feel for the candidates. And then the following day on Thursday, the 27th, we will have, um, closed panel interviews, um, various members of city staff, the community, and then the council will have an opportunity to meet these candidates and uh, hopefully be able to find somebody who is a good fit for Monmouth and our community and uh, get get to work letting, as I've said many times, Chad back to his golf game. So. <laughs> He's done a tremendous job for us, but we do have an opportunity to, to uh, hopefully meet a couple of great candidates. And I hope folks will join us um, either for the live stream and or for recorded sessions to get to know those folks that those uh, more information will be out about those on Facebook. So thank you very much. Um, and I have also uh, just wanted to follow up a little bit again on comments that were made at the last city council meeting um we um at the end of the meeting two weeks ago during during council comments i took the opportunity to give a personal response to comments that were presented to us group of polk county residents most people watching that meeting didn't stay through the slog of actual work we do as a council um apparently it's not as exciting as we try to make it seem um, but because of that, people missed what I said. And so I have a comment I'd like to say again. Um, and, and that is uh, that this city council supports the Monmouth Police Department. Um, we are not abolishing the department. We are not cutting the department. We aren't talking about reallocating funding to other services. Um, that has been referred to as defunding the department. We've completed our budget work for the year. The, a very engaged and active citizen budget committee helps make uh, input into those decisions. And none of that's happened. Uh, we don't plan to do it, nor has anyone asked us to do it. And anyone who has heard we were considering that, I welcome direct questions to clear up those misconceptions. That's that's just not been on, on our agenda. Um, and because of those meetings, um, and those comments, some some difficult things have happened in our community the last couple of weeks. And, you know, I want to say that we we just 
we don't condone the kind of um, unfortunate ways people have of disagreeing with each other these days. Vandalism, um, threats, or intimidations of any kind, that, that's not going to help us solve the kinds of differences that are coming out. Um, we support people actually reaching out to talk to each other and challenge either direct accusations, but question assumptions, implications, and the inferences that are being tossed back and forth in public and private forums. These things, when repeated, are taken as truth. And with all the media options in the world today, they cannot be put back in a bottle, no matter how wrong those are. They're difficult, uh, they're unpleasant, and they're messy conversations. And they are most valuable when people hold them at the lowest level with each other. People trying to understand each other um, is what will get us through difficult times. I am making myself available for as many of those conversations as I can, and I'm sure other of your representatives are as well. Um, the group last time asked us to respond to some specific requests. I've sort of been working with spokespeople from that group to clarify those, so we don't have direct response to several of them yet, um, but then we will. I'll be working with council to discuss anything that requires our attention. So I want everyone here to know that we work very hard for all of you to uphold the oaths that we took when we took office here. Um, each of us swore to abide by the laws and constitution of the United States and the state of Oregon and the laws and ordinances of the city of Monmouth. And we do this, and I will say again, without pay, uh, believe me, without a shred of glory, um, sacrificing our time. As you see, we call in from vacations, we show up with um, injuries. We are here. We are, in some cases, limiting our personal and professional goals to devote time to represent everyone in our community. And um, hopefully that, uh, I don't don't say that because I want sympathy or pity. As I said, my mayor's notes, I signed up to do this, but um, I appreciate people that are really making an effort to try to talk to each other and get through this. Um, that concludes my mayor's report. So uh, we will uh, have reports of council representatives, of boards and commissions. Has anybody met? And, Madam uh, Mayor? Yes, Councilor Lopez. Yes, thank you. Um, since uh, since our last meeting, I have uh, I have met with the Mid Willamette Valley Homeless Alliance, and while I I do not have a lot of um, material uh, material things to bring back as of yet, I I'm incredibly energized by this group. Um, now this is uh, this is the in some ways, physical manifestation of the continuum of care, but also so much more. And I, I very much look forward to, uh, to bringing more findings from them back to council here and to uh, strengthening our role in um, our commitment to serving everyone in our community, including and especially those that are at need and without homes. Great, thank you. And thank you for again, accepting another assignment. Um, outside of the regular work to support them. That's great. Thank you. Any other board or commission reports? Councillor Carey. Uh, no real report, Madam Mayor, other than to say that the uh, Planning Commission has a meeting scheduled uh, for tomorrow evening, 7 p.m. Uh, the access point for that, I'm sure, is, is uh, on the website under agendas. Um, and on the agenda is uh, a discussion about a couple of design reviews in the uh, um, Ash Creek Station, and, um, and then a bit of a uh, discussion about the uh, Edwards Addiction um, Phase Eight extension. So uh, I, I don't think there's anything raw or shattering. If anybody's interested, Planning Commission tomorrow night, 7 p.m. Great, thank you very much. The work goes on. Anybody else have anything 
we should start getting our department heads in here to kind of let us know what's going on since we don't get to see them all as much in our boards and commissions. Well, they're there. They so just they're they're working. Yeah. They, well, they haven't turned on the camera. So oh, they're the all video feed. Yeah, they're, they're back. All. They're out there. Hi guys. Um, that takes us to our city manager's report. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor and members of the City Council. Uh, just a few things uh, to mention, a follow up to the Mayor's comments. So uh, each of the Council has a schedule for next week regarding the interviews. Um, Wednesday afternoon, we will be providing a tour for both candidates. Um, I'll, I'll be doing that. Probably we'll um, ask one of the other department heads to participate as well. Um, shuttling them around and then they will have their um, Michael Douglas interview uh, with the with the mayor that evening and then um, the next day I told him old people know it as a Michael Douglas interview uh, I, but we're calling it the Ellen style interview <laughs> and then the next day so the interviews or the process will begin at 10 o'clock in the morning there's a uh, three panels, actually four panels, but one is two panels made up of department heads. So because there's uh, a large number, we're breaking them into two. Uh, they'll interview two, there will be a brief lunch break. And then Steve Worthington, the uh, Prothman consultant, will meet with the council for an orientation and as well with the uh, third panel, which is the community uh, leaders panel. And beginning at, um 1 30 the interviews those interviews will happen the last through 3 30 and then uh, representatives of each of the panels will um, debrief with the council um, i instructing them not to make recommendations but just to provide uh, input uh, their thoughts as to the interviews strengths and weaknesses of the candidates and so on and then at uh, four o'clock the council will go into deliberations and hopefully at that point we'll be walking away i can go back and work on my handicap um excuse me um chad can you just just give me the dates and the times and the where we need to be i guess we're going to be doing this remotely but the date again for our obligations as the council for these interviews so this is next Thursday, the 27th. The 27th, okay. And you will be need to be at, so the, the interviews will be in person at WU. I did send a, a schedule to all of the council today. So you should have a, a emailed copy of the uh, schedule to you. But uh, it, currently it's set up to be in person and the council should anticipate arriving about one o'clock over at Wu, and you guys the council will be in the columbia room okay in the columbia room that that's in the one at one o'clock and where is the columbia room is that there in the in the center yes it is in the warner university center um the easiest way to access it it's on the lower level um but it's kind of around behind the building there is a parking okay. lot we'll we'll be sending out parking information so it's an easy level is there is is uh, parking pretty easy this um right now okay yeah, okay. yeah. so and uh, so wednesday wednesday the 27th 1 p.m at Wu in the columbia room at the warner center Thursday the 27th. Thursday the 27th. Okay, I didn't write that down. Thursday the 27th, 1 p.m. at Wu in the Columbia Room. Uh, correct. And it's a, a good comment to bring up, Councillor Sharmer. I will send out parking instructions and kind of the how to get to from the parking lot to the Columbia Room. Okay, I appreciate that. I can't walk very far these days. Yeah. So we'll we'll send something out and follow up um, when we get a little bit closer. All right, thank you. Sure. And uh, are there any other questions regarding any of the logistics uh, with the council? Looks like Roxanne. Has Roxanne. Um, how, how long do you anticipate? Because if you remember, I said I'm not available after 6:30. I have to be in Salem at my board of directors. 
No, the, the council will go into deliberations at four o'clock and you should be finished by 5.30, uh, six o'clock would be my guess latest. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> I've got to leave at six. Yeah. So, yeah. okay. Uh, I, unless I'm surprised, uh, the uh, I wouldn't expect it to take more than an hour, hour and a half. Oh, okay. Thank you. Just wanted to make sure you remembered that. Okay. Yep. Thanks for reminding me. Anything else? Okay. 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 Excellent. Um, also today I sent out a, I sent out two emails. Um, so one included the, the tracing project. So you heard the presentation by the, um, the, uh, the Western university folks that are uh, spearheading the, the tracing project. And I sent out a one page, uh, newsletter that they distributed, um, just to kind of uh, keep you in the loop on uh, what they're doing. And um, I have also today sent out a uh, memorandum from Chief Talon uh, regarding his semi-annual report, his trespass report. So he provided that to me yesterday and I um, will we'll include it for some additional discussion at your September 1st meeting, but just to let you know that was distributed um, to the council and I think um, just for the record, do you want me to go ahead and read it into the record? So this is from Chief Talon, uh, dated yesterday. It's regarding this semi-annual report, uh, trespass, trespass upon city property, exclusion from city property. Mayor Coons and members of the Monmouth City Council on January 21st, 2020, the city council approved an amendment of Monmouth City Code 9.10.190, trespass upon city property and in addition to Monmouth City Code 9.10.195 exclusion from city property. One of the additions requires a semi-annual report to the city council advising of the implementation of the ordinance. Additionally, it calls for the summary of circumstances related to any citations or arrests and the disposition of the citation or case. As stated, the amendments were passed on January 21st and thus were effective on February 20th, 2020. Monmouth police officers were made aware of the changes shortly after the date of passage and were advised to provide information about the ordinance to help educate any person found in violation of the ordinance. Officers were also advised to continue current practices of using good discretion and encouraged to provide any available information, alternatives and or resources two persons they contact on city property during hours when buildings and properties are not open to the public. This practice is still ongoing. A search of the Monmouth Police Records Management System dating from February 20th, 2020 through July 31st, 2020 revealed that no citations, arrests or exclusion notices were issued for violating the trespass upon city property ordinance. With no citations issued, there were there are currently no case dispositions to report. So your first six month report and there's been uh, no, uh, no issues really to report at this time. So good, to, good to know. And as uh, Daryl, as the police chief advised, um, that's the, uh, what would be considered normal uh, practice for the department. Thank you. Um, just a quick COVID update. Um, the, uh, Community Development Director is going to provide the council with the COVID-19 business support programs update. So I won't uh, talk about that too much. Other than that, COVID, we're still just treading water, um, you know, until, as I've said many times, I anticipate we'll be in this mode for the next uh, three to four months, at least, uh, probably, you know, through January until a vaccine is, is made available uh, widely available to the public. Um, so uh, we're, we haven't had any issues. We do occasionally have a staff member exposed uh, to somebody else that may have tested positive and they will go into a uh, 14 day uh, quarantine until, you know, to ensure that there's no, uh, uh, anything is passed to other staff members. But other than that, I don't have anything to report uh, COVID related. And uh, 
the only thing I'll, I'll mention, the library is doing a great job with their uh, curbside pickup program. So they're expanding that. And uh, I'm glad to see that they're able to do what the best they can under the circumstances. And that's all I have. Um, but I, of course, I'm open to questions. Any questions? Uh, Councillor Sharmer? I just have, I just have a comment. Um, with flu season arriving soon, um, it would be great to advise everybody to be sure to get your flu shot so that it's not your illness. You don't have an illness that's mixed up with COVID and it turns out to be the flu. But I think Bymart offers the shots. You can get them at your physician. Um, those of us on Medicare get them for free. Thank you, Dr. Charmer. <laughs> Any other questions about the city manager's report? Um, okay. Then we will, thank you, yeah, thank you. We will go to citizen comments and um, I will entertain the folks here in the room and then Phyllis can let me know if we have others. We do have, uh, Suzanne was gonna provide her. Oh yeah, program. sorry, we have one more, <laughs> one more report because we've been doing cool stuff um, regarding yeah. our COVID response. Thank you, yeah, clear yeah. over there. Thank you, and I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, good evening, uh, Madam Mayor, and honorable members of the city council. Uh, my name is Suzanne Duffner, I'm community development director for the city of Monmouth and here to give a uh, brief update on our COVID related uh, business support programs that we are offering um, to help businesses uh, through the recovery um, and their economic impacts um, from the virus. So uh, some exciting news, uh, we've lent out um, all but one of the uh, grant and loan awards under our Business Oregon uh, grant that we received last month. So we've made uh, six awards to a number of small businesses, some are sole proprietors, uh, some are women owned and a couple are minority owned businesses. So uh, really exciting to see that money get out uh, at where it's needed and uh, we've got one more. So, <laughs> you know, somebody that has not already received the uh, federal uh, payroll PPP program or the EIDL, uh, send them my way and, uh, and we will get them some assistance. So. And then other nudes, uh, the city of Monmouth has partnered with our local chamber of commerce uh, to help uh, store and distribute some PPE supplies to local businesses to help them in their efforts uh, to comply with local health regulations. Uh, we purchased a number of face masks, some face shields, uh, gloves, and sanitizer and uh, cleaning disinfectant, and we'll have those available to businesses starting this week at the Chamber of Commerce office. They're open uh, five days a week, so it's uh, uh, convenient for them to be able to stop in their, their offices on 99. Uh, we are limiting it to one business visit uh, per month to try to help spread the love, um, but we'll, we're offering those for free to businesses just to try to help out with uh, those additional costs to, to their businesses. And we're using our uh, CRF, our Corona um, Relief Funds to, to help um, purchase those. Uh, we also, the city applied with the City of Independence and uh, Indy Commons, that's a small business support, business type incubator um, in Independence for uh, grant funding that would help provide technical assistance to businesses during the This COVID. conference will now be recorded. Now watch what I say now. <laughs> 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 uh, and so, um, Unfortunately, that grant uh, was not awarded. However, uh, the uh, Indy Commons um, director, Kate um, Schwarzler, is also working with the City of Independence and has invited us to look at a way that we might be able to retool that um, program with our CRF funds and still provide uh, this technical services to businesses. And um, they'd be some really nice one-on-one -on -one, uh, counseling and coaching to businesses to help them with their websites, which are so important right now, uh, and social media, getting the word out of um, an online sales. So really hoping we can do something, uh, stay tuned and we'll keep you posted on um, if we're able to make something happen there. And then just <coughs> lastly, what I've included in the packet, a little report on now that we're winding down the Business Oregon grant and loan program, uh, we're looking to roll out um, a city of Monmouth COVID business recovery grant program for small businesses um, with that CRF funding that we had mentioned um, that we received uh, through the CARES Act. 
These would be small uh, grant awards, somewhere in the neighborhood of about $2,500 um, to businesses that either had to shut down um, during the stay at home order or they saw a severe decline uh, in sales during that time. Uh, the awards would be to go towards um, items to help the business um, with their recovery to, to, to stay open and then also to kind of reposition um, themselves to be able to um, do, you know, COVID safe business practices, whether it be through uh, more online sales um, or purchasing additional equipment that they need. Um, let's talk to a, a gym business owner that's trying to set up outside and offer classes and they had to purchase um, and had a bit of expensive equipment and buying uh, rubber mats to allow people to work outside. So um, this, this support fund would, would help those businesses with some of those um, costs that they're seeing. So um, the city uh, would partner with the Willamette Workforce Partnership. Um, they have done several of these grant programs for a number of communities in the mid Willamette Valley. They kind of have a niche card carved out now. Um, where they do it through an online portal system and they do all of the, the grant review and administration. So it's a really, really slick um, program that would save our staff capacity, um, which is pretty limited. So um, they've done the, this grant program for Marion County. They're currently doing one for the city of Salem. They've done one for Yamhill County. They've worked with the COG. So they're, they're very well experienced. And I have reached out to them and they are uh, so that they would be available. So they do, of course, take a small administration fee for that service, but I think it'd be really helpful to, um, to be able to, to partner with them. So there are some more details that I've uh, outlined in a draft of kind of how that grant program would work and I'm anticipating starting that opening that up in the beginning of September and then being able to um, advertise it for a week prior to that um, and with that I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have John Carey Councillor Carey um, Suzanne I noticed in the um, the eligibility and ineligibility it referenced uh, Businesses that comply with, um, you know, Oregon, you know, laws and all that. Does that include governor, uh, governor's uh, uh, proclamations relative to mask usage, uh, gathering size, that kind of thing? Um, yeah, I mean, I believe so. Those are written as executive orders. So um, as far as we can uh, track and verify that, a lot of these uh, grant and loan programs are self-certified. Um, but yeah, we will definitely take that into account. Mm -hmm. Questions about all these programs. And, and remember, this is in addition to Suzanne's regular job supporting the uh, planning commission and all the other work. So the amount of communication and really cooperation and collaboration with our chamber, with independence, with each and every business I know um, you've been reaching out and, and working with them and taking a lot of calls. So I really appreciate this. I'm glad that we are able to get a little bit of this money out. So. All right. Okay. That's all. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, now we will go to council or to public comments. And so I have some speakers here. And when I call you, as soon as Suzanne clears the area there, and there's the disinfectant wipes if you want to wipe off yeah, any of the table area let her get her computer out of the way um then you can take a seat over at that computer so that we can see you and and speak into the microphone and our first speaker tonight uh frank morris so frank if you want to come up introduce yourself and the city where you reside and we'll um, hear your comments. Good evening. My name is Pastor Frank Morris. I live in Monmouth, Oregon, and I've been in Oregon for 27 years. Um, one of the reasons I came, somebody, there was a story I told, and it happened uh, about 26 years ago. I worked at Circle K uh, store and two o'clock in the morning there was a group of four guys that came into the store and one of the monmouth police officers happened to see me looking out the window 
deer in the headlights, totally terrified. I was, I was in trouble. Um, the guys were coming with beer and everything else, and there were two things that I could do. One of them was call the police, which I had learned never to do. Um, as a black man, if you're in trouble, don't call, because they're going to come get you. So I didn't call, but I saw the police car outside, and I did the big eyes and everything else. The other thing was get ready to fight, and I was used to doing that, to fight. So I walked to the other side of the counter, but before I got out there, three total of three police cars showed up and the cops came out and they wrestled the guys to the ground. Everybody was arrested, seven different counts and everything else. That is the first and only time in my life that I've used the police. Um, I am still afraid of the police. My mom is still afraid of my behavior with the police. And it's one of those silly things um, because I have a trust not only in God, but in the community and the effect of the community. The phrase that I keep putting out there is honor to honor and protect. And we as a community need to be a part of it. I was glad for the mayor's message tonight. It's one of those things that we are responsible for one another in everything that we do. Um, I don't like that people still come up to me and tell me about the laws written because of my skin color. You know, we used to get to beat you once a year especially since you married to a white woman. We got to beat you until you left town. Or, you know, you couldn't go walking through that town without a certain amount of money in your pocket or too much money in your pocket. And people love to tell me those stories. We still live in a time and a place where it's fun, ha ha, to tell those stories. I was outside um, doing the yard two weeks ago and a big pickup came by with the Confederate flag and four guys sitting inside there. Yoo-hoo, yoo And I made sure to stand real quiet near the tree, waiting for nothing to happen. That's not normal. And I still live in that situation. It's not something that the city council can necessarily do anything about, but you need to know that it's still out there. It's still a problem. One of my fears, I grew up inner city Chicago, inner city Boston. I've, I've lived in 14 different states. I've traveled around. I've been as much of a problem as problem has come to me. Um, I worry that we're going to have a confrontation when the two different political or social sides meet each other. Right now, we're really fortunate in this community that the college students aren't here. The college students are learning by watching TV. Um, personal story, I was a drunk uh, 15 years ago. Yes. You got about 20 seconds. Okay. I was a, a drunk about 15 years ago and I never drank outside the house because the only black person that most people around here saw was on cops and what do you do with a drunken black? There's this interpretation, the black students are coming back and I want us to be ready for the black students coming back because they have an agenda, they have an attitude and they have a right to stand up and be seen as being humans. So that's my that's my worry and that's my call. Blessings. Sorry. Sorry. That's okay. We have the alarm off, I thought. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Frank. Yep. Yeah. Thank you very much, Frank. So let's oh, see yeah. if I can. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Kathleen Rudel and Gimp, yeah, name and see where you reside. And I turned the alarm off this time. So. My name is Kathy Rudel, and I do live here in Monmouth. And um, I've been, I, th I think, well, once Mr. Trump was elected, I did start becoming involved in activism. Uh, made it first of all with immigration and uh, fighting what's been going on with that and it with an interfaith movement group. Um, and now I'm at that corner up here on 99 and Main Street every night uh, because I do care what's happening to the people in our community who are of color. And so what I wanted to really share tonight though was two instances that affected me. I moved here like 10 years ago because my fa I have my daughter here and her family. And these two things have happened in that amount of time. Um, 
The first one was my son's girlfriend was staying with me for a few days. She suffers from severe mental and anxiety issues. Her father was an alcoholic and used to put beer into her baby bottle so he and his friends could laugh at her trying to walk. Because of this, she has suffered brain injuries from ingesting the alcohol. While she was with me and I was at work, she suffered a major panic attack and began running down the street screaming. The police were called and they took her to jail. She had no medication for her seizures and her had an attack and fell down the stairs. The police need to have training on how to deal with mental health issues. I found out today they do call people now and I'm very happy about that because we do need people with mental crisis to have proper care. And being going, going sent to a jail is the worst thing that can happen to them. The second thing was, I was told about young boys drawing Nazi symbols on our streets. They were given a pass on that and they should not have been given a pass. They may be young, but they will grow up. They should have been required to take classes on races, racism. What they did is a hate crime and it should have been reported to the state agency that deals with that. They learned these hate signs and to be racist from someone. From this incident, a lot more racist Nazi symbols appeared at Western Oregon University. And I was very disappointed when I saw the hatred that was happening up there. And the only other thing I wanted to say was, um, I did listen in last week and when the Truth and Freedom group was here, I guess I don't understand what they mean by who's truth, who's truth and who's freedom. Are blacks and browns included in that freedom? And I was glad to see in the IO this week that Mr. Lopez spoke about his journey around race and I really appreciated that article. And Madam Mayor, I was very happy to see that you made some comments that Mr. Van Rose made that were not true and you, you um, spoke to that, that they were not true. And I was very, very happy to see that you had done that. And I wanna thank you both for doing that. And I also want to thank the city councilors who have stood up with us who are up here at the corner every evening. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Oh. <clears throat> I'm gonna wipe down yeah. Susan. Oh, sorry, no, that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. She can. That's okay. <laughs> that's she, she, <laughs> she can do that. <laughs> and then Berta. Yeah, I guess I'll let them just talk loud. Yeah, <laughs> you do have to talk a little loud. Yeah, okay. Good evening. Madam Mayor, Council members, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Your, your name in the city. I'm Thanks. I'm Berta Thanks. Aronson. I live in Monmouth. I've been in Monmouth uh, almost 10 years now. Uh, and I'm a retired <clears throat> psychiatric social worker. I'm 71 and I'm white. Now, why do I mention that? Because I didn't know I was white until I was well into my 30s. I was informed of this by a facilitator of a cross-cultural workshop I attended was part of my job. I worked at correctional treatment programs for many years. <clears throat> so why didn't I know I was white and more importantly, what that meant? Well, I'm 99.9% .9 according to 23andMe ethnically Jewish. And I grew up in a Jewish community in Boston area. I grew up hearing stories of family and friends we lost in the Holocaust. And I've dealt personally with anti-Semitism. I didn't really feel like a minority till I came to Salem in 1976 and discovered there was just one synagogue. And I also was astonished to see how very few people of color there were. It was definitely a culture shock. Fast forward to the late 80s and getting some education on racial issues. I discovered that I had no idea how people of color saw me or that being white gave me some unearned privileges. Many uncomfortable but profound conversations later, at the very least, I know that I don't get followed around stores. I've never had a gun drawn on me by police at a traffic stop, nor has anyone interfered with my right to vote. No one has ever yelled a cuss word at me just for being white, though I've been called worse for being Jewish and for being a woman. I have gotten yelled at and sworn at for being part of Black Lives Matter demonstrations and 
once I got over scared, being scared, um, it just made me sad. I have a Black Lives Matter sign in my yard. Other neighbors have We Trust Our Police. I'm sad that some people think those things are opposed. And I just don't. Because I believe that most of us are people of goodwill who want the same things. Without talking to each other, however, as humans, especially if we're afraid, we tend to run on assumptions to assign meanings and motives without having all the information. I was highly concerned after the last council meeting that this is happening. And I also was glad to hear your statement, Madam Mayor, to get some clarification going. So really, I'm just here to say that coming to understand each other may be uncomfortable at times, but it's not that hard or that frightening. And discovering that you have bias and prejudice like just about every other human on the planet doesn't mean you're a bad person or have to drown in guilt. It just means there's work to do without everyone's voice at the table, without listening to understand each other, we're just shouting slogans and that doesn't fix anything. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Oh, yes, I, got it. I got it down. Yeah. Cleaning crew, cleaning crew. <laughs> <laughs> Reset. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, Rebecca Salinas Salaveros. And may I put my, uh, am I far enough to, yes. is yep. that okay? You are. Okay. All right. I just forgot my glasses. I need that. So Rebecca Salinas Salaveros and I'm a mom's resident. Good evening. I'm here to share about the Black Lives Matter movement in Monmouth. We are Monmouth for justice. When you think about Black Lives Matter for Monmouth, associate that with Monmouth for justice. We are also parents, grandparents, teachers, migrant workers, farmers, veterans, youth and college students, small business owners, grocery store workers, and overall good American citizens who want positive change for our Black, Indigenous, people of color, and all members of our community. We are not vigilantes, looters, criminals, or trying to take away anyone's freedoms. Monmouth has unique needs and our requests are appropriate for our community. Black Life Matters and Monmouth for Justice is all about equality and making life better for everyone. It is not anti-police, anti all lives, nor anti-freedom. It is quite the opposite. The Black Lives Matter movement is not about hurting anyone. In fact, that is what we are trying to prevent. It saddens me to hear
observation that we don't care about our police. Our family, immediate and extended, includes police officers and law enforcement professionals. We have built relationships with many police families here in town. My in-laws are even godparents to children of a local police officer. Our family also includes active counselors who are better equipped and trained to assist during domestic disputes or with individuals coping with mental issues. <laughs> if anything, I believe that Monmouth is ahead of the country in this area. The city already reallocated resources to hire mental health professionals who accompany police officers. And I commend this forward thinking of the police and the city. We would like to see more transparency with the police. When white people are stopped by police, we are nervous about how much the ticket's going to cost us. We are not fearful for our safety. But when people with brown skin are stopped by the police, they worry if they will be humiliated, physically hurt, or unjustly end up in jail. The national data supports their fears. Blacks are 30% more likely than whites to be stopped by police. And when, when stopped, blacks and Hispanics are more than 50% more likely to experience use of force by police. And blacks are 21% more likely than whites to have an officer draw a weapon. Stories from our Monmouth residents at the last two city council meetings support this data. In addition, Native Americans, black people, and people of color are disproportionately killed by police with Native Americans killed at three times the rate as whites and black people killed at twice the rate. Black Lives Matter calls out that the sense of freedom is different for those who are white than for those who are not. We've had meaningful conversations about this with people who stop and talk with us on the street corner and message us through the Monmouth for Justice Facebook page. I encourage anyone who would like to turn, learn about the Black Lives Matter in Monmouth to come out to the corner any day at 4.30 and ask questions, learn, and have meaningful conversations with neighbors. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm a yeah, we're good. White that's, that's okay. That's, <laughs> that's all we have here in the room. Um, I'll check Thank with you. our city recorder, Phyllis Bowman, and see if there were any other folks I did, on. I did not get any comments, Mayor Coons. Anyone wanting to comment? All right. Thank you very much. And thanks again um, for joining us this evening and sharing your stories. We appreciate um, having folks who are helping us understand these um, tough times. So thank you. And thank you, uh, folks on the line. Our, um, uh, that will bring us actually to council comments and announcements. Um, and then again, we will move into a work session uh before we go to an actual urban renewal meeting as well mm -hmm. um, but uh council comments or announcements this evening <laughs> councillor belts sorry um, i just wanted to acknowledge that today is the actual 100th anniversary of the passing of the right for women to vote the final state ratified it on this day 100 years ago Please, you have the right to vote. You have the responsibility to vote. So vote. Thanks. Anybody else? As a descendant of Elizabeth Cady Stanton, one of our um, suffragists, not suffragettes, suffragists, um, I appreciate that. Councillor Lopez. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I, uh, some of you may know, many of you may not. I, I spend most of my uh, most of my time not working on council matters, uh, working in the uh, in the business community, specifically um, uh, specifically in the service industry uh, with winery. And I I just wanted to stress the importance of mask wearing and good personal hygiene as it relates to uh, to our business community. Um, the, the wine industry, like many others that are service-based, has, has been hit very hard. Um, and this, uh, this spans across uh, almost all sectors of our, uh, of our business, um, uh, of our businesses here in Oregon and most of the country. 
Um, so I, I, I have a message, and uh, that is uh, save a business, wear a mask. Um, so please follow governor's orders. Uh, there is an alarming number of individuals that I personally have seen out and about uh, not following mask guidelines. And um, I, I just ask you on behalf of Oregon small businesses, please wear your masks. Thank you. Anything else? Any community announcements we've missed? All right, then I will adjourn our business meeting and we'll go ahead and just go directly into our work session discussion about uh, stormwater and water system master planning. Um, maybe take a <clears throat> little bit of break after that exciting topic. And here they go again. They're all leaving for the fun stuff. People. <laughs> This is what the job is all about. Yeah, know. Well, you know, we are streaming tonight. So when you get home, all you have to do is log in. All right. And I will turn this over to Mr. Russ Cooper to uh, tee up our discussions again about water, water water that we get water that comes down on us and water <laughs> yes yes tonight is the the night of waters so thank you mayor uh coons and members of council uh tonight we've invited uh, both john uh, gillarducci and, and doug gabbard to come back uh, uh to visit with us to continue the discussion of implementing a, a stormwater utility uh in your staff report i've included uh, three items that are for your use tonight and as we continue to move this process forward of implementing the utility uh, at your july 21st council meeting uh, council requested the consultant prepare their uh, final report for your use as you consider uh, the current and future actions uh, for moving forward with impl implementing the stormwater utility uh, the consultant has been uh, you know is here uh, tonight uh, they're not going to necessarily present their report in detail, but they are available to answer any questions that you may have uh, concerning the content of their final report. Um, the second item in your packet that I'll bring to your attention is a, a series of emails that have been uh, generated through an, uh, an intentional uh, outreach campaign on the city's Facebook page and website. Uh, the intent was to inform residents of the new uh, uh, stormwater utility, you know, that's that's uh, being proposed and ask them to provide you with comments. Uh, this outreach is ongoing uh, with uh, Facebook posts planned uh, routinely. Uh, the idea is that we'll continue to try to address questions or misconceptions and uh, also encourage residents to go to the city stormwater webpage to learn more and then send uh, comments of either support or concerns that they may have about this with you. Um, I'll, I'll mention that as part of the outreach campaign, uh, I'm also in the process of, of mailing out our large customers a letter uh, directly, uh, informing them of the utility and, and asking them uh, to, to do the same thing, to, to go to the, the website uh, and and uh, provide you with with their comments. Uh, they also have been given my direct contact information so that they can, you know, if they have questions, they can reach out to me directly and and uh, try to clarify those issues. Uh, I'll also uh, highlight and and maybe thank the I/O uh, the week of August fifth. There was a nice article uh, in the in the paper. Um, helping to kick off the, the current outreach campaign. So uh, that was nice, that, that got some good press. Uh, and then the last item in your packet is the draft ordinance. That's the primary uh, uh, topic of discussion tonight that uh, John and Doug are here to address. Uh, the final ordinance once adopted establishes a utility with all the lawful powers to plan, manage, construct and maintain uh, facilities associated with the stormwater utility. It also provides uh, the city with the ability to establish a permanent funding mechanism. Um, I'll identify that uh, since the 
uh, staff packets went out. There have been two changes uh, that have been identified that needed to be added to the draft ordinance and Doug and John will uh, cover those in their review. And then I'll also identify that I'm still working with uh, Lane on uh, some language uh, that uh, will help to ensure that, that we're able to address our larger parcels that have multiple buildings on them or multiple utility bills. Uh, the, the additional language will clarify how uh, credits might be applied to those similar parcels. The example uh, or examples might be Western Oregon University or the, the uh, Ash Creek uh, shopping center across the street where you have uh, multiple buildings on a single tax lot, uh, but they each have a uh, separate utility and that in conceivably they could uh, implement some sort of a um, stormwater uh, structure that would allow them uh, the ability to apply for credits. And, and right now I'm not sure that the current language in the ordinance addresses those type of parcels. So we're still working on that and you can, you know, we'll, we'll discuss that a little bit as we uh, move through the presentation with John and Doug. Uh, but uh, I wanted to bring that up so that you are aware that the, that the final ordinance will have some additional language along those lines. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Doug and, and John uh, to discuss the comp components of the ordinance and uh, will be available you know, for your comments, questions, uh, both uh, with uh, the ordinance or anything else that's uh, included in your packet. Wonderful. Uh, I'm, I'm Doug Gabbard with FCS Group. Uh, I am joined by the principal on this project, John Gillarducci and also joined by analyst Tim Wood. Is it appropriate for me to share my screen? Um, and if, if I'm able to do that, I will, um, I will be able to put the, dra the ordinance on the screen as we are. Oh, yep. I, so I'm gonna... Yeah, either she or I can try. Phyllis, are you trying yeah. that or Jenna? Yeah. What no, if she does? She's done. done. You've got it. Organized. All right. You are presenter. <laughs> can you see the ordinance on your screen? Yes, thank you, Doug. All right, wonderful. So. So, Council, it's wonderful to be speaking to you again. Um, what what I'd like to do tonight is, in as conversational way as possible, uh, I'd like to walk through the ordinance as it currently exists, uh, and I'm going to point out some things to you that I think are interesting. If you have things that you think are interesting or want to ask a question about, I would encourage you to do that. Uh, uh, many, many hands have made this light work, including city staff, and so we may hear from some of them as well. I want to particularly extend an invitation to Mr. Shetterly, uh, who is welcome to jump in at any moment uh, to provide further clarity where he deems that to be appropriate. So let's start taking a walk. Uh, and, I, and I don't consider recitals to be interesting, so we're gonna, just going to pass by that. Right to section one of the ordinance. Section one is the meat of the ordinance where code language is inserted to your, to your current code. Uh, have a little table of contents there. It begins in section 10, and I'll be referencing sections by these last three digits. Uh, section 10 is the purpose. It does, it does one really important thing, which establishes your stormwater fund. So this is a bucket that you did not have before and you need it. Uh, it there, there are no provisions yet for putting money in or for taking it out, but it is important that you establish that bucket. Section 20 says that this, this law is applicable to all of Monmouth. It does not say that every, everything gets charged. That discussion comes later, but the law applies throughout Monmouth. Section 30 is a bunch of definitions, and uh, I thought it would be great just if I read these to you one at a time. Um, of course, I'm not going to do that. There are, this is exactly what you would expect it to be. 
Um, however, you know, if you much of a stormwater utility is based upon impervious surface area and the theory of how that contributes to runoff. And so if you ever get the question, well, what counts as impervious surface? There's a definition for that. Uh, and so surfaces include, uh, but are not limited to rooftops, concrete, asphalt, roads, sidewalk, paving, you, you get the idea. It's all in here. It's meant to be as comprehensive as possible to uh, be as clear as possible. So if you see any of these phrases capitalized in subsequent parts of the ordinance, those are defined terms. They have a specific meaning. And this is where you would refer to know what that meaning is. Starting in section 40, we get a little more businesslike. We're going to start, talk, start talking about the rate structure. We explain in section two here that, that service charges are based on runoff. And specifically, we have these categories that we want to be uh, uh, as clear as possible. Undeveloped parcels, a term that was defined earlier, are not charged. City roads, as defined earlier, are not charged. That is on the theory that they are actually part of the stormwater conveyance system. Single family residences are charged and they are specifically charged for one ESU, which is one uh, equivalent service unit, which is also defined earlier. Other developed parcels are, are charged uh, based on their impervious surface, uh, which translates into the number of ESUs multiplied by the unit rate. And the unit rate defined earlier is the charge for one ESU. Here's the first little bit with, that was added quite quite recently in the process. Uh, developed properties consisting of multiple parcels shall be treated as a single customer, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, any applicable rate adjustment would apply only to the portion of the property served by mitigation. Here's, here's the story behind this. Imagine you have Mr. Cooper. Well, I was just, I was just gonna point out that that is one of the sections that Lane and I are still uh, working out and trying to clarify that language. So this is this is is kind of a I guess a a, a snap you know a quick peek at at what we're trying to do. But the language in the end is going to be different from this, and we're going to try to uh, tie in instead of just parcel of land or multiple parcels of land. We're going to try to bring in a, the concept of of the water meter or the the utility by okay. which we would assess the the fee too so it, it'll help as we start looking at these larger parcels that have um you know a large tax lot may have multiple buildings and multiple water meters on it and we want to be able to assess each building its share of the impervious surface area of that tax parcel. So that's that's where we're still trying to clarify how that will play out, but uh, it, you'll see uh, a section in the, the rate, uh, rate setting, I think is this title, as well as the, the two sections down, the service charge adjustment and appeals. There'll be language in those two sections to try to help clarify how we deal with our larger parcels. Yeah, that, that's correct. I, I wouldn't spend, uh, get too focused on this language. This language has changed already, but the concept is exactly what Russ described. Very good. Okay, so so we will continue on then. Just a second. Sorry. Sure. Um, Kel Councilor Schinkel had a question. Hey, Russ, can you give an example of a property that we have that might fall into this category just so I can wrap my brain around this? Yeah, I sure can. So over at Ash Creek Station, uh, we have a, a particular tax lot that is shared with uh, Roth Shopping Center, eventually a, a Starbucks and a Papa Murphy's and, and maybe even a fourth building. They're all on the same tax lot. As you read some of the previous sections, you'll see that we're the focus of the stormwater um, kind of unit is based on a tax lot. Well, Roths, Starbucks, 
uh, they, you know, each of those buildings uh, contribute to stormwater. Each of them has a, a water meter or a utility bill, which is the mechanism by which we're going to assess the fee through is through their utility bill. And, and by, uh, by having the ability to assess each of those uh, buildings, their fair share of the impervious area of that tax lot uh, is what we're trying, that's the goal we're trying to get to so that we aren't having to, I guess the only other way that we would assess the bill would be then to send a totally separate bill to the property owner, which is different than what we're doing with everybody else. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks Russ. So as we continue down, oh, I'm sorry, yes. You're fine, go. Uh, along that same line, <clears throat> Uh, and, and because of and using that Ash Creek Station development as an example, um, how how are we? And maybe that's what you're wor working on, Russ. But how are we gonna identify who's parking, whose portion of the parking lot belongs to who? And it, it, it currently, if we were to assess tomorrow, Ross would be paying for whatever, and then when uh, Papa Murphy's or Starbucks comes online. How will they? Will that be a reduction on the um, that that portion of the parking lot, not the roof line? Um, will there be a reduction on the rots component? Um, I, I'm not quite sure how those multiple parcels are going to work. I, and, and then for that matter, how do you di differentiate between the tractor supply? parking lot and they rots so, i mean one will park in one and walk to the other and that, that's all that that is difficult right so so that's a that's a great question john there's a there's a couple of ways that we'll be able to do that through the through the planning process uh each of these uh land uses are required to provide x number of parking spaces and so that will that will create a a way in which we can uh, help to kind of determine that with with the Ash Creek Station, each of those parcels actually in the through the development process, they laid out what I'll just call a shadow plat of what 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 portion of the tax lot is associated with each of those businesses. So we would continue to uh, uh, have that model uh, played out as we move forward with future developments that are similar. So Ash Creek Station is already kind of defined in their in their own site plan and design. So if there's no business there now, but we'll be in a year, um, what is the just pick one out that we've heard about Taco Bell. Not there yet. Will be sometime. Are we going to begin charging them for the the required parking spots before they get there, or when do they when do they come online? Uh, I'll I'll just say at this point we I haven't answered that question. My assumption at this point is that a business is not necessarily going to improve more surface area then they have to. And so the surface area that they improve is actually that area within their development. Uh, and then we would not assess a fee for development that has not occurred yet. That fee would be assessed when the, you know, that subsequent business uh, came in. All right. Not seeing any other questions, we'll continue our walk down the ordinance. Section 50 is about quantifying the size of an equivalent service unit, and you're gonna to begin to see a pattern here. The number of square feet of impervious surface in the ESU shall be established and may be revised by resolution of the city council from time to time. 
that that final phrase shall be established and may be revised is is a phrase you're going to see three times in short succession and remember last time we talked about this i was telling you there's there's a number of of off ramps to go and the ordinance will not specify any numbers well here's your first example if you've looked through our report we do have a quantified ESU, which happens to be 3,542 square feet. But it, it doesn't belong in the ordinance because it could change. At some point, that may be different, and you'll want to have the authority without, without an ordinance to go in and make that change. So that will be revised, uh, established and revised by resolution. Likewise, the unit rate, which is basically the rate the stormwater rate per ESU that will also be established and revised by resolution of the city council. No dollar figure here, just as we talked about last time. Okay, section 70 begins uh, dealing with exceptional cases. This is not going to be the normal case, but service charge adjustments and appeals. This is think of this as the rate credits section. <laughs> Um, there is described in here a, a process and a set of criteria for uh, receive, requesting and receiving a, a rate credit, or as it's described here, a service charge adjustment. So in, in subsection two here, um, it's, a, a credit may be granted or approved when one or more of the following conditions exist. A is all about there being an error. Um, now, the, such an error would not happen with a single family residence, which is why they are carved out, because all single family residences by definition are charged one ESU. But if you have a business and the, the number of ESUs that you're charged is not specified in this ordinance. And if the city says, well, you're going to be charged three ESUs, and you say, no, you miscalculated, you're wrong, this is the process for fixing that. And you definitely want to have that process. Um, subsection B is all about the case where there's no, is, there's no development. It's not been developed. But the parcel has been misinterpreted as being developed, and if it's in its natural state, it it should be, should, you should correct your billing because you're not supposed to be charging them. Now, C and and what follows under C continues on to the next page, and it's really the the uh, uh, the meat of this section is all about credits. So credits can happen when you have uh, a constructed or natural on-site stormwater mitigation facility that meets a certain set of conditions. So you build something to mitigate your runoff. And the, the most important uh, criteria is that it must be in excess of the city standards. You can't just do what the city says to do and then say you're entitled to a credit. So the city has minimum standards for what you have to build, and anything that you try to get a credit for must be in excess of those standards. And there, and and the the conditions go on. That's that's the important one, but the other conditions. But I'm going to pause here because I see a hand. Doug, this this Chad. Um, so I'm assuming for the for a credit to be approved, it would have to be. Uh, since they're building in excess of the design standards, it would have to be pre-approved uh, before the improvement. It has to be acceptable to the city. So yes, there would be, um, in essence, a, a, a negotiation between the city and the developer that they're building something that is of use to the city and actually will, because they're building it uh, in excess of the, of development requirements, then it um, that that excess is usable and of benefit to the city system. Under, understood, yeah. but okay. the discussion would happen prior, you know, during, um, design. yeah, design. when the uh, construction documents, during the design meeting with, it, it wouldn't be retroactive. They wouldn't be able to come back after the improvements were completed and said, 
say we deserve a credit, this would be negotiated in advance of the improvement being completed. So we, we did not specify that, uh, Chad, we could. Um, we were envisioning that there, there might be cases where, um, and again, because the city has to accept it, it would be up to the city as to whether uh, it was whatever they had done on site warranted a credit. So it would certainly be to the developer's advantage to work with the city before right. development to get that done, but we didn't write in that hard requirement. Yeah, it, it wouldn't preclude them from coming in right. uh, during the process, construction yeah. or afterwards yeah. and, and making the request. Right. Okay. John? Yes. Oh, other John, sorry. Oh, sorry, John other. Terry. The John. Yeah, I'm, I'm the other John. Uh, I, um, you know, I don't know how we get around this, but I've got a problem with this one. Um, what if what if requirements change? We have we have a, a city requirement uh, that was in place when, for argument's sake, the Bymark parking lot was was put in place, um, and but yet they, they, they're the and then we have a apparently a city or perhaps even a state requirement that was put in place um, in a time uh, that that required the Ash Creek Station to construct that that uh, stormwater collection pond. Um, but yet they're going to be charged at the same rate and at the same. So, and and I, well, I don't know, but just looking at it. It seems to me that the the impact on the stormwater system created by and mitigated by the retention pond and with the Ash Creek Station is far less than the um, parking lot of Bymore. It, it yeah. just—I mean, I don't know. It, it, there's a lot of water. A lot of rain taps come down before any water goes into the storm sewer system. Uh, Based on that, even as large as it is, based on the uh, uh, you know the Ash Creek Station uh, selection pond, uh, you know I'm thinking of the of the um, at the university, um, the new recreation building there, uh, the, the health and wellness center. I don't remember exactly the timing on that, but there is a ton of wastewater collection, water gardens, rain gardens, all of those things, all designed to mitigate the impact. So the square footage tells you one thing, but the actual impact tells you another. Now, all that to say is I have no idea how to solve this, but I'm afraid it might build some inequities in there based on what was in place at the time of construction. So so the the intent is, and I don't know if this clearly expresses it is that you're subject to the the requirements uh, the current requirements so if requirements change over time and you are not maintaining um, or your or your on-site facility no longer meets or exceeds better word exceeds city current requirements then you would no longer be eligible for a rate credit and and we could probably stand to clarify that but that that is you brought up a great point. That's how this is usually dealt with to avoid exactly, you don't want different generations of requirements applying as you go through time. It's much cleaner to hold everyone to the current standards uh, for the purposes of rate credits. Right, but, if we're, but if we're talking about the actual impact on the system, that's, 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 where, I get, that's where I get tied up. Um, the more the more sophisticated these stormwater collection systems become, the less impact on the system that it will be. And so, if they, I, I, and I'm, I just don't know. How we, I don't. I, I don't know. I'm. I'm, I'm sure. sorry. I'm, I'm not. Oh no! Not, this. These are. This is. The credits so, are one of the most complex, difficult issues that we deal with in in stormwater. So what we're what we're trying to we're trying to keep it simple, believe, believe it or not, and and say that um, okay, a a person who's providing some kind of on-site mitigation 
if if the sum total of that on-site mitigation no matter what it is no matter how complex it is no matter how aesthetically pleasing it is if the effect of that is only to mitigate their own runoff into the system you know they have um yes they have reduced their own impacts but they're not doing anything that is of additional system benefit they are meeting the city's development requirements to mitigate their own stormwater runoff it's only if they do something over and above that let's say you have a development that's that's going in and you want to have some stormwater conveyance in front of that property and you ask them to build it larger than they than their own development needs you, that you want it bigger so that it can convey stormwater from other parts of the city that might warrant a rate credit but if they build an on-site detention pond to detain their mm -hmm. own runoff that's not worth a rate credit they're just meeting development requirements and that's a cost of doing business so what what we're proposing is you know, I guess it's a relatively high bar for getting a rate credit, but um, that protects the fund financially. If you are too generous with the rate credits, you end up giving away more money than is actually being saved by the on-site activities of your customers, if that makes sense. And that's, so that's why you have to make sure that they're doing something that is of benefit to the utility. Um, in order to get a, a rate credit and make make the financials part of it work and i hope that makes sense lane can you can you see uh subsection uh seven it talks about a credit is revocable under conditions where the facility no longer operates at the design level established during the drainage plan review and approval process Right. That particular subsection, uh, you know, is intended to to talk about the city's ability to remove the credit if the if that facility is no longer operating. But it does speak to that point in time when it was approved, and and can does that section somehow provide implication that the credit could be could be tied to a point in time and not uh deleted or or um you know i think you know what i'm trying to get at yeah uh, but i think john's point is kind of the opposite and that is where you had um the buy mart uh, that was developed in 1970s uh and and, and hasn't done much it, there wasn't much done in terms of modern stormwater control because it wasn't required then they're going to get so many credits just based on the formula in the ordinance. Then you're going to have the uh, Ash Creek Station come on and they're building to new and higher sta basic standards. And so they're incurring more expense to meet the current requirements. But in meeting those current requirements, they're still just going to get the same equivalent credit, or, uh, the, 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 be treated the same as that Bimart store. And I think that's what, John, if that's what your yeah, issue is. It is. I, I think we need to fix this. Yeah. The only way you could, I, I'm, I'm trying to think as you talk, and I'll, I'll keep pondering, you know, it, that may be just something we have to live with, that, you know, as, as development occurs, it has to meet current standards, and we know those standards change, not only with regard to stormwater, but with regard to building codes and everything else. Uh, you know, the, that's just a fact of development. Um, you know, a way that you would do this, and I, I wouldn't recommend it at all, would be that you, you know, you establish a point in the past and say that anything that exceeds the development uh, requirements as of that date, you know, um, when the when the buy mart was built, then you get a credit if you exceed that. Uh, but, you know, at that point, then you're really giving people credit just for doing what they're required to do. So I'm not sure that satisfies the equity issue either. I think this may be something that you just have to accept. Uh, number one, um, you know, development has to comply with development codes. Uh, and that's a fact of life that uh, may cost more, but they're also going to have a building that's newer and worth more than the buy mark uh, when they get it done. Um, and, you know, in the scheme of things, these aren't huge dollars we're talking about anyway, probably, uh, in these credits. So it's not as if we're tipping the scale in favor of older development and against new development. I don't think this is going to discourage anyone from, from coming on and developing 
new property and, and meeting current standards, and they'll just live with the fact that what they get is they're going to be treated the same way as the Biomark store. But uh, I just on that. that final comment from me on that is that the more we tie the fee to the current standards, building standards, development codes, um, the further we get away from actual impact on the system. And and I think while well, not I mean, it, it, there's a good chunk of this that we're trying to recover funds, I think, that uh, reflect impact on the system. And the modern designs are going to have less, are going to result in less impact on the system. And whether or not that's the code now or the code two years ago or five years in the future, it's a different impact on the system. We've got to figure out how we can charge them equitably. Okay. All right. Are we ready to continue down the ordinance? Uh, let's. Uh, I would like to speak to uh, the bullet uh, number six there. That is the the other uh, section that that I continued to. Uh, work with Lane on an example of this, and it, it might help uh, answer Councillor Carey's or address Councillor Carey's concerns. But uh, the example being uh, Ash Creek Station. Ash Creek Station's constructed, it's got multiple buildings on a single tax lot, and um, they would each be assessed a fee for their portion of impervious surface area. Now, if one of those buildings came in and they were, they were uh, maybe more environmentally conscious or forward thinking with regards to stormwater and, and management, and they build uh, excess facilities that mitigate you know, beyond what is required of them for that property, that particular parcel, uh, uh, percentage of the parcel, it would be due a credit. They're, they're reducing their impact on their footprint, but it's, it's a small amount of the much larger impact. I will also you know, just say that with, you know, as we're talking about Ash Creek Station, uh, the big structure that they built was a, that was part of requirements for uh, for constructing it, both both from the city and the state, those were required of them. So there's really nothing in that large facility that is above and beyond. Okay. So so far, as we finish up subsection two, all of this has been about: is a credit applicable or not? When we get to subsection three, we now address the question, okay, how much is the credit? And and as, as you've noticed from the report, we have calculated for various scenarios a percentage of the rate that can be a, a maximum percentage that should be considered for credit uh, when a credit is applicable. You will notice here, though, there is no percentage provided, that percentage shall be established and may be revised by the resolution of the city council from time to time. So there's the third instance of that phrase, and it applies to the percentage of the charges that you want to credit when a credit is applicable. Subsection four is hey, all about, oh, yes, sir. Sorry, I, real quick, this was one of the areas where we're Again, trying to keep it simple, if you qualify for the credit, which again, we've tried to make a reasonably high bar, then you either get it or you don't. So it's up to, and the, the credit we calculated is around the 40% range. So if you qualify, the idea is you would get that 40 plus percent credit against your rate. There are no 
gradations up to the 42% if you if you qualify you get it so again makes it easier for staff to administer and protects the city as well thanks Doug you betcha. So subsection four is all about the information that the city is entitled to collect to determine if a credit is applicable. Service five is, is about the timing issue. I think this came up a few minutes ago, and this subsection indicates that, that uh, credits are not re retroactive. They, um, uh, they will apply only to the bill then due and payable and to bills subsequently issued. So the timing issue is uh, addressed. So there are, very, there are further provisions. These are process provisions um, about, about decisions on requests for uh, credits and time periods. Um, Section 80, now that you've established the stormwater fund, we, we say officially in a, in a certain place that you got to use this money for stormwater stuff. That's what that section's about. Uh, section 90 is commencement of charges. So for new constructions, charges commence with the issuance of a building permit, creation of an impervious surface area, or installation of a water meter, whichever comes first. For existing structures, service charges uh, will commence on the effective date of establishing a unit rate. Why am I reading this to you? I'm reading, the, uh, I believe this came up a few minutes ago. There was a, a conversation about a Taco Bell. Am I remembering that correctly? So <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking that that, does this address that issue? Yeah, maybe, maybe not. Okay. Well, it, it, it addresses another it issue could. as well, which no, is, oh, sorry. Uh, for that part of the, uh, it's clear in terms of the, the, the part of the structure that would that would create additional impervious uh, surface. It's a little unclear in terms of parking, the parking spaces that they're required to provide that may or may not be there. But but I I, I think it's clear enough for me. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, that that's most of what's interesting. Uh, any delinquencies are handled basically the same way that you currently handle utility delinquencies. Um, uh, and of course, if any part of this is determined to be unconstitutional, we just lop off the unconstitutional part uh, through little uh, lawyerly amputation. And the same to property tax. There's a whole history behind that provision. Um, in, in other places, it, it was quite a fight to make sure stormwater charges were not considered property tax. I'm not going to bore you with that, but but that's the ordinance. So I think I think we are uh, open to you know any que additional questions you may have on the ordinance or or any of the information in your packet related to uh, the stormwater utility. Um, so the other thing, just uh, kind of as a reminder with woven throughout that report, um, there are, again, a lot of information that's been presented to us in the past, things that we still have to decide. As mentioned, all this does is say this is looking like where we know we need to go to even have this in place and basically since we've already written some lovely checks to uh doug and and john and their group it'd be nice <laughs> if we finished up by at least giving approval to keep moving in this direction again then we have lots of off ramps and i appreciate that terminology uh, as we go forward, because we are still gathering public comment. Um, thanks, Russ, very much for um, gathering those and including those. Uh, we all got a copy of a letter tonight uh, that had been mailed, uh, sent in from some folks, again, with sort of their questions and concerns. So we're getting some good public feedback that we will be able to take into consideration later on down the road. but. We are specifically now still just looking at the ordinance itself. <clears throat> and 
Any questions or Ro concerns Roxanne. or considerations about that? Roxanne. Yes, Roxanne Belts. I, I just wanted to actually thank um, Chad and staff for getting a copy of this information on our Facebook page in English and Spanish. So thank you. That does help our community members um, so that they understand this as well. And thank you for replying to some of the comments and then helping people kind of understand in a bigger picture. Send us the information, send us our comments, and then we can look at all of that in aggregate as opposed to us all trying to look at Facebook. So thank you, Chad, very much for taking care of that. Yeah, Russ and Suzanne, mostly. Okay, other comments or questions, Mr. Carey? I, I, I'm sorry to be, uh, be like I am. Um, <laughs> the, yeah, how do I answer the, and I'm, by the way, I'm completely on side with this, but I'm trying to figure out a way that I can, that I can, uh, um, you know, be a good salesman for it or salesperson as it were. Um, I, I, as I looked at the single family residential charge, which um, is a flat rate, it's, it's average, it's aggregated, and it makes sense that it is. How do, I, how do I answer the question from the resident that says, you know, my drain pipes are not connected to any pipe that runs through the street. The only runoff that I have comes off my driveway. Nothing coming off my roof gets to the street and as i drove up and down north high street i rode my bike up and down north high street today i discovered that myself and one other residence has a connection to the street now it's an older division older subdivision probably any anything that you know any downs well now i've down well I've downspouts not that old, and uh, it either runs into a French drain of some type, uh, or it runs into uh, the old uh, terracotta uh, style uh, pipes, tile, that in my case have collapsed, and while I've got a hole in the curb, nothing gets there. Um, now, I'm, I'm happy to contribute uh, to the overall good of the system, but there will be those that say, wait a minute, I'm not contributing to any of this. So I'm asking, hoping Doug or John has got, this is not a new question, I'm sure. No. So <laughs> help me out with how I respond to that person up the street that asked me that question. Okay, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take a shot at that. And Doug, you can chime in after me. I, I think the first, there, there are a few things. Uh, ju just among us, I, I guess, uh, one one thing that uh, I'll admit is that you know stormwater and the, the rate approach that we take to stormwater is an imperfect approach. It's just uh, and and it just so happens you know impervious surface area is the best that we have among um, some not very good options. And impervious is is good and it has held up because it, it is a good measure of what creates runoff, uh, contribution of runoff that has to be dealt with by a public system. But parcel by parcel, we can't meter it. We don't know, you know, we don't know how much individual parcels are contributing except for that general approach to look at the footprint. A, a, a developed property on top of a hill does a lot more to, to contribute to problems at the bottom of the hill. You know, there are all these, there are all these um, specifics that we, that we can't really address with this type of rate structure. So that's not a very satisfactory answer and I wouldn't suggest that you use it, but I, I just, it, it kind of is what it is. Um, the, uh, the reason that we take a sort of one size fits all approach with single family residential is because there are so many of them as customers and they just don't vary that much. So even, you know, a, a large developed new property is not 
that much different from a smaller footprint in when you consider the differences between Western Oregon University and a 7-Eleven, you know, that where you've got commercial or institutional parcels that are so vastly different, you have to account for them in the rates. So there, and there are some, there are some, a, a handful of, of uh, rate structures in the Northwest that actually take their single family residences and group them into small, medium, and large, or they actually charge by the measured impervious on single family residences. Um, the reason I think that you, we wouldn't suggest that you do that is because it's a tremendous cost for the benefit. It's an ad ongoing administrative cost to track that data and know who's added a bedroom or a deck or a porch or a patio. And most cities have decided they don't want to be in the business of charging single family residences for small improvements to lots like that. So um, they just uh, acknowledge that, yeah, impacts are different from property to property, but this is the best approach that we have. The, the other rationale that I think really does um, resonate with people is no matter what, and it kind of reverses the language, but no matter what you are contributing in runoff, you are still a beneficiary of the public system. You are protected from local flooding. Your, you know, your property, because that public system is there, has less flooding, we hope, and you're able to travel throughout the city because flooding is being controlled in other parts of the city. So you are a full beneficiary of that system, even if the specific characteristics of your property are different from you know, the neighbor or someone across town. So those are those are my those are my best arguments, um, and if I can, this yep. this came up as an issue, a question in in Dallas, and uh, the analogous situation. And John, you were getting close to it there, since really this is a there's a community benefit to the system, um, which justifies a, a community contribution. An analogy would be to uh, the property owner who who has the house. But no kids in school, uh, but still pays taxes to the school district. Uh, they're not they're not getting any direct service to their family to their children from the school district, but it's recognized as a community benefit um, that everybody contribute to uh, the school system. And so there's an analogy there. It's not perfect, but it it, it it's relatable anyway to the uh, community benefit of the um, uh, of the stormwater system. Yeah, and I'll also add, uh, Councillor Kerry, that uh, you know to to help with that is that the the component of of the entire uh, services provided, you know, the amount that comes off of your roof into the roadway is a relatively small component of the the larger uh, suite of services that are provided through the stormwater utility, and. Um, and so you're receiving other benefits that that you are paying for. The other thing that I that I might mention is uh, do having done a fair amount of digging in our part of the state during the winter. If you dig a hole, it is likely going to fill up with water, and that water is either groundwater or surface water that you know we just don't have. We almost have impervious clay layers. So the, even though that water runs off of a rooftop and drops on the ground, it's still going somewhere. And in our area, most of it ends up sheet flowing across and really does end up either in the, the street by going over the sidewalk and curb or end up in a trench line somewhere that ends up in our conveyance system anyhow. I, 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 really I really just, oh no, oh no, there we go, sorry about that. It's hard not to when you're I, used to zooming. I, un I unmuted. It's really oh, hard I, in the room. Yeah, I, I really just wanted to thank, um, thank, uh, you know, Russ for that uh, very, very thorough and thoughtful answer to that. Um, that really answers a lot of my questions about, um, about that scenario. 
I, uh, I, I also wanted to point out that, you know, while, while we are spending a lot of time discussing, um, discussing rate credits, um, this is something that, gosh, I, I'm really still not sure if I, if, if any credits are a good idea, um, and how, uh, you know, how, how that will impact things. So, um, I do, I do appreciate the rate credit discussion. It definitely, uh, definitely shines a lot more light there. Um, but I, I'd be really interested in a future discussion on whether those are appropriate for our, uh, our city or not to begin with. Well, that, Madam Mayor, that, that conversation would be apt uh, in two weeks at the next council meeting because you will have an ordinance that has a rate credit in it, um, unless you direct uh, staff otherwise tonight. Uh, and between first and second reading, you can uh, uh, decide uh, even then that uh, that you want that excised, and it just comes out. So this this is the time, or or the next meeting. Yeah, that's and, fine. And I'll that's, also that's the discussion. I'll also say that we have been intentional in trying to set the bar high for a credit, so that it it isn't uh, maybe necessarily easily attainable. But if somebody does or an entity does do uh, something that that would meet that standard and does go above and beyond and exceeds, uh, you know, there is that ability for the city to issue a credit. And, and the, like the flip side, I guess, would be, the flip side is that is that we have a you know we have a, a an operating. Uh, level of money you know a, a level of money that we need to operate and so when you when you credit one facility uh you know and basically you spread that credit out over other facilities and might it might an example of the above and beyond be as obvious as the um ackerman building at western which has water recycling recollection has a lot of really specialty features built into their um, lead certification. Would that be an example? Ackerman Building is a is a great example of another a number of the issues that I'm you know that I'm working with Lane to try try to address in the language as well as this this credit concept. So yes, that is a building that was constructed that went above and beyond. They collect. A fair amount of their stormwater, reuse it inside their internal plumbing for flushing uh, toilets, at, you know, as gray water. That is that is definitely an investment that's above and beyond. It is a it is a an improvement that is already done. So when you know we implement this process, they would then could come in and request a credit for that parcel. So. Chad's question earlier about kind of the timing of when you could request. That's an example of some, uh, a retroactive request. And then the other kind of, you know, interesting part about that is Ackerman Hall is a, is one building on a much larger tax lot that has multiple buildings, parking lots and, and so on. And so for us to credit that entire tax lot, a flat 40%, it it uh, it's not. I'll call it. A, it it doesn't come across as an equitable uh, credit. It would be a really large credit for you know that that isn't the same as the the level of um, exceeding the standard as as what we would want. So I hope that helps to answer. And so thank you for identifying Ackerman Hall. Yeah, and obviously if. Roths and Tractor Supply and Papa Murphy's wanted to build in gray water recycling, they, they could exceed as well. So, yeah. Um, okay, other questions or, or thoughts, comments along the line of Councillor Lopez about the not considering the rate credit? Because again, that is a, the language will change between now and two weeks from now, but if that is a big chunk that we need to remove and renumber everything, that might be helpful to our staff now. Chris. 
I, I, I'd, I'd like, like to, to discuss. Oh, oh no, no, again. There we go. Sorry. Oh my gosh. It is. It, you are correct, Madam it is, Mayor. It, it is, is very difficult really to hard. get out of the uh, habit. Um, I'd like to discuss the the, the reasoning behind um, my my level of discomfort with the rate credit. Um, if if we look at this as a whether it's a um, whether it's a uh, impact on the capacity of the system or whether it's an environmental impact, um, a lot of the issues that we deal with are um, in in the grander scheme of things are what one would consider non-point source, right? And so if you take that as an analogy and look at you know point source being um, being these uh, you know, uh, business uh, business arena um, buildings and these industrial buildings, per chance, and non-point source being everything else, residential, too much of it to count, and apply those rate credits only to those, um, you know, what what I'll call point sources, those larger points. Um, if we if we divvy, divvy up the town, the largest percentage of non-permeable surface is not in business districts. The largest percentage of non-permeable sur permeable surface is in those residential uh, residential lots. Now, yes, they're individual lots, and so it becomes very difficult to administrate, um, but that's that's where most of our runoff comes from because that's most of our uh, non-permeable surface and most of our uh, uh, zoned area. Um, so, I understand the intention behind doing something good with those rate credits. Um, I, I do understand the, um, you know, the token appreciation to builders that would, that would um, encourage. encourage that kind of construction. Um, but I, in the case of Ackerman Hall, you know, there was no credit. They didn't do it. They did it for other reasons, and I think that anyone doing it will be doing it for those other reasons, not for uh, forty percent of three ESUs or, or whatever it may be. Um, and so it is uh, it it is a token thank you, and I think that matters. But it's such a small token, and there's so much consternation about it that I, I'm not against it, but I'm not convinced either that we need it. And that's that that's where I stand. And I'm looking at the report and I'm thinking that information might be on page 46, the ESUs lost to credit adjustments. We're looking at 214, so. See, so is that 46 at the bottom of the page? Or 46 sorry, 46, I, I look <laughs> at, at the, the top. Page 22 okay. at the top of the page, page 46, if you're open in a PDF. Sorry, I'm looking online. <laughs> sorry. So page 22 of the actual stormwater utility formation doc document. So am I correct in that? We're talking yeah. about 10%? That we, we had to make, an assumption about how many uh, ESUs would be essentially lost to credits, right. and right. so we made that assumption based on what we've seen in other in other cities. Almost always, fewer customers actually apply and receive the credits than you would expect, um, but that's where that number came from. So it's about ten percent. Yeah, ten percent of the non-single family residential and about five percent right. of the total that's right byron to to chris's point uh this being a a, a token thank you my concern and, and maybe this is why you do them is to encourage people to engage in good behavior if you don't give the credits is there any indication that they still won't you know any historical data to indicate that that will chill construction or or be in some sort of impediment towards you know any goals that the city might have if we don't if we don't do the credit is it going to hurt us in any way as far can, as anybody can tell we 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 haven't seen that in other 
in other locations. And, and I can tell you there for the 100 plus utilities in Washington and Oregon, probably 50-50, maybe 60-40 give rate credits, but there are, but there are many that don't. Um, and I, and I don't think we've seen, you know, anecdotally, uh, you may have commercial customers who complain that they have to do these on-site, you know, requirements and they don't get any credit for it. But that, those are the anecdotes we've heard, um, no evidence that it's cast a chill, but that's just. But they, but they complain as they build the buildings, right? <laughs> that's what I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> That, that's what I've seen. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and it it sounds like those complaints come from having to meet uh, minimum requirements. It doesn't sound like anybody's complaining about and maybe I misunderstood. It doesn't sound like anybody's complaining about, you know, hey, I'm going above and beyond. I'm going to complain about it because I want a rate credit. It sounded <laughs> like those complaints came from meeting those minimum requirements that wouldn't really um, uh, qualify for them them for a credit anyway. Yeah, that sounds like complaining point. for complaining sake to me. I, I think I'll throw in there that oftentimes when, when folks go oh, above and beyond the minimum requirements, what they are trying to, that, you know, it's kind of two, two things, but it's the same thing. They're trying to achieve a, you know, something like a LEED certified building or, or some sort of a, a facility that, that has, you know, that meets a certification and, and is is seen, you know, as green or forward thinking. And I I think Darren could probably speak to that because he was involved with the university when they were building that building and whether that was again to potentially save money had we had it in place or whether it was because it was a, an opportunity to sh share their values about those things. Um, I'm guessing they save a hell of a lot more money on electricity in that building than they would on a stormwater credit, for example. But uh, Roxanne, mm -hmm. did you have something? Well, I, I just was thinking um, whether a business gets a credit or not, uh, let's say there are no credits. I mean, ultimately, the cost of whatever their fees are, whatever their utility bills or rent or whatever it is, that's passed on to the consumer one way or the other. So. In essence, our community members will be paying for that, whether it's a credit or not. Do, or do I misunderstand that? Well, that's generally true. Okay. Get one last chance to uh, make your case, buddy, and we're moving on. All right, and uh, you know my 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 last uh, my last uh, my last case here, and this you know go once again goes back to the root of what I said before to build on what Councillor Belts just uh, just pointed out. Um, a a resident who has done improvements on their home similar to those that has that that a business might have done, but on a business scale that resident would then bear the brunt of the business doing the improvement, even though a resident would in theory, could in theory be doing that same improvement. And it's that kind of inequity that, uh, that, that leads me to discomfort. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm done. <laughs> Nicely done. So I uh, would entertain any guidance if anyone would like to tell staff to remove the rate credit portion in response to the eloquent comments of Councillor Lopez. I'm with Councillor Lopez. I say yank it. Okay. Byron. I have to agree. It sounds like it's m more equitable not to have it in. So we can always add it again later. It's probably harder to pull it once it's in place. So. That's, That's three. Nice. Uh, I would. I'm. I was one of the ones that suggested we have it. <clears throat> I'm still there. I don't think there's a big fiscal impact. It's not going to cause anybody to not um, build in Monmouth. Uh, if if it were pulled and if it were not available, um, uh, I think it's an opportunity for the council and the city to, um, if if in fact we are interested in. 
um, these type of issues, uh, sustainable building, um, uh, environmental issues of this nature. Uh, this is a, a chance, albeit a, a small one, but a, a chance to, uh, to uh, for us to you know put our values where um, you know where our votes are. So uh, I, I'm for leaving it, but I don't think it's a big deal either way. Councillor Sharma or Councillor Silbernagel? Laurel? I couldn't tell if that was a wave call on me or a wave. I don't know what to think about it. Um, I, I agree with Councillor Lopez um, in some aspects, but then I also agree with Councillor Kerry that at least um, if it's in there, we're showing the residents of Monmouth that we care about whether or not they're making an, an effort to make their property more permeable um, and for us to recognize that and let them know that we appreciate it through a rate credit. But again, Councillor Belts made an excellent point that if we give rate credits to businesses, they're just going to pass that along to us anyway. So I. I'm torn. But, but let's be clear, a rate credit is a reduction in expense. It's not an increase in expense. So if they pass it on, that would reduce cost of their goods and services. That's right. <laughs> All right. So Darren, sitting out there in the woods. <laughs> That's about right. Hey, uh, so I guess I'm still where I was before and that I would say it's we're going to have a lot of expense, I think, overall, over time, trying to justify which ones are in and which ones are out. So I, I think at least initially we shouldn't provide it. If we choose to do that differently because we hear lots from the business side, then we should add it back. But I'm, I, I guess I'm still a no at this point. The no's have it. I, I and I, I agree. I always look at the cost benefit of administration and any carve outs, any exceptions, especially if we look at equitably changing them over time based on technology improvements and things like that. Um, and I'm, I'm not looking at Janet, but I'm sure she's like so thankful <laughs> to hear Darren bring that up and me to echo that. And that's probably because Darren and I are finance directors and we're like, please, just please make it simple. So. Well, Cease, then if, if that's what I hear, then uh, what, the ordinance that you see next week or next meeting will not have the rate credit in it based on this guidance. Um, although you've not made, nobody's made a final decision here. So if there's more, discussion at the next meeting um we it, it, it's it's uh, we can plug it right back in if, if somebody wants to see a rate credit we can do that before the second reading so we'll just take this for that first uh, draft that you'll see for first reading but by no means have you made a final decision tonight thank you so john has two whole weeks to up his game on his argument but no lobbying and between now and uh, and the uh, meeting in two weeks <laughs> <laughs> So thank you very much, gentlemen, once again, for the hard work and making this understandable to all of us. Um, and we'll we'll move forward on that in a couple of weeks and appreciate everybody's patience with the discussion. Thank we you. have one more business item uh, before we take a quick break for the urban renewal plan. And it looks like Russ still. Yes, thank you. And I see uh, our consultant Edward Butts on the on the screen there as well. So I'm glad he's still with us. Uh, so this topic is uh, a quick review of uh, the draft 2020 uh, water system master plan. Uh, our consultant is Ed Butts from 4B Engineering. He's been uh, the city's primary water engineer for the, the 25 years that I've been here, uh, uh, very good at what he does. And he's gonna run you through the kind of, at a real high level, the master plan, uh, the, the CIP that goes with the, you know, with the master plan and uh, will be available for, for questions as well. If there's any um, 
you know, if there's not any significant changes or comments from council as we go through this, then what we'll do is bring the 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 final uh, back to you at the next meeting as well for your adoption. At that point, then we would take it uh, and send it over to the Oregon Health Authority Drinking Water Program for their review and uh, approval or adoption as well. So, Ed, go ahead. Oh, we can't hear you, Ed. Kevin's technician coming up. And then Ed, Ed, if there's continued problems of getting audio, you can call in with the number as well. Nothing yet. Hey, Russ, I had a couple questions while we're waiting. Yes. Is that possible? Sure. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Um, this was a this was a very interesting report. It's like a history book. It, we were one vote short of being called Dover. <laughs> <laughs> that was very interesting. I'm, I was happy to see it. Um, the report says that we use um, 97.5 gallons per day per person of water here in Monmouth. Do you have a way, any way of knowing how much of that is for irrigation? Uh, Ed might be able to answer that question. Uh, that, you know, I mean, that's a that's an that's an average per day. Yeah, uh, when, that's right. When we, so it's when how much we water is used every day divided by the number of people in the city, right? Right, right. And then you know, there's some difficulties in there with the the university being a relatively or or previously being a relatively large irrigator had an impact on right. our total water production. Um, but uh, I don't have an answer to that question. Has anybody ever talked about um, the possibility of spending a couple of years, maybe more than that, putting together a, a good um, water conservation program um, here in Monmouth, um, encouraging zero scaping and, and uh, helping people learn how to not use so much water? Has anybody ever uh, talked about that? So we've, we, we had a, you know, it was more through the power and lights conservation program, but they offered uh, low, uh, low flow fixtures uh, for a number of years. And then the, the building industry has really reduced the, the daily consumption through low flow fixtures as well. Uh, one of the recommendations at the end of, of the uh, water system master plan is that the the city go through and do a, uh, do our water uh, management and conservation plan during that process we'll work with council on identifying um, you know particular activities that that we as a city want to work toward in you know in the in the realm of a conservation program mm -hmm. okay well that it would be nice if we could be even nothing more than thinking about that. Um, I, there's an awful lot of grass. I know we're in a big grass seed growing area here, um, but boy, grass uses an awful lot of water when you have to keep it green all the time. Should we check in with him to see if he's talking yet? Not quite well, yet. No, not yet, Ed. Okay, um, I had another question. You've got your filters in place and they've all been improved and everything, right? Yes, Rest. correct. Um, the report says that they are intended to reach, re, um, to catch particulate matter. Um, they also catch pathogens. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. All right. So I wanted to make sure that they 
um, are doing that. Um, and do you know how small the filters are? Is it 10 microns or less? They are, they are. At least 10 uh, microns. They're 10 okay, microns. Can you hear me? Can you yes, you can, Ed. Yep. Okay, I'll, okay. I'll, all right. I'll save my questions for later. Well, I'll answer that question. Uh, the uh, two series of filters, the first set of filters is uh, 10 micron, and then the uh, final filters is one micron. Laurel, you're still unmuted. Do you have additional questions? I know. I'm just, I was just going to, as long as we're on that topic, one micron is not going to pick up viruses. Is that right? Uh, it's, intended, it's intended to pick up uh, parasites, actually. Viruses, parasites, are, uh, okay. viruses are picked up or handled by the chlorine. Chlorine. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah, I really apologize for this, folks. Can you hear me still? Ed, you're fine. It's it, it's a little bit quiet, but uh, I think if you can uh, bring that mic in a little bit closer to you or turn the volume up, uh, you're good to go. Okay. All right. <clears throat> the um, water system master plan that we prepared uh, for the city is actually a compilation of uh, about 15 years of work that we've been looking at. Uh, most of the um, work has uh, was started around <clears throat> 2005 as a uh, actually it was intended as an update to the original 2000 plan that i i wrote um, in well plan i wrote in 2000 and um, we've been looking at uh, various uh, situations over the last 15 years and we've deferred the uh, master plan for several reasons uh, one of the principal reasons <clears throat> was that uh, we had some immediate issues with the water system we had to deal with. And so we had to push back some of the planning efforts uh, in order to handle uh, those situations. Uh, part of it was well number two that we had to drill and um, get online. And then we've also had some issues with leakage and similar problems. Uh, but anyway, the uh, master plan is actually now a full master plan. It was originally to be an update, but um, I changed that a few years ago so that we would be able to uh, actually incorporate the full plan as a uh, water system master plan to replace the 2000 version. So it's intended to uh, uh, span between 2020 to tw the years 2040 inclusive. And um, the, um, the main principle or the main impetus of the plan is to uh, reinforce the water supply to the city. Uh, we also look at these plans as a forensic study to help determine the um, current state of the water system as well as what we need to do in the future. And um, all in all, the, the current state of the water system, I feel, is very good. Um, of all the systems I work for, it's probably one of the most average type of systems. It doesn't have a, um, a great deal of uh, water usage or water loss. Um, the number of um, is just under 100 gallons per day uh, per person, which is actually a typical value for most water systems in Oregon. And the current leakage and loss rate that we're incurring is around 8 to 10 percent which is a little higher than we like to see. But in a system such as this, with the distribution as old as it is, uh, system as old as it is, it's fairly, uh, fairly good average. The, uh, the main parts of the water system that uh, we looked at, I'm sorry, I'm a little hoarse tonight, is um, the um, water system from the supply side to the distribution and into the storage facilities. And um, all of those um, included a seismic evaluation because current laws require that we actually evaluate the seismic condition of the system. So we took a look at the uh, uh, principal elements of the system and how they would impact um, water supply if there was a seismic event, most likely the Cascadia subduction zone earthquake 
And uh, those are incorporated into the master plan for the first time in Mama's history. And that um, encompasses a considerable amount of the, of the work that we're planning on the later phases. Uh, rather than um, normally what I do in these is I present them based on the executive summary and um, highlight parts of the executive summary. But um, I think I'll just go before I lose my voice into the um, into the capital improvement plan, which is what most folks like to look at anyway. The uh, capital improvement plan has been set up to um, reinforce water supply and uh, as well as the uh, areas of the distribution system that are deficient and uh, also uh, transmission between <clears throat> between 4th Street pumping station and the city itself. Um, we've divided this into four phases fairly equally as much as we could. The uh, first phase is um, includes the elements that we feel we need to uh, accomplish in the next few years in order to um, get the city into a uh, reasonable state of of readiness in case there is any uh, issues with uh, a um, seismic event or something and uh, to reinforce the water supply from the um, source wells. So in doing that, uh, the first phase, uh, we're looking at replacing a uh, the Marion County number one well with uh, two new replacement wells uh, so that uh, the hope is that we'll be able to remove that well field from filtration and uh, use it on the future Willamette River wells that we're planning on incorporating. Uh, the um, again, the um, master plan is somewhat divided in in different areas and phases to um, to allow us to do that. And uh, I would um, at this point. I, I would. I guess I'd entertain any questions because I am losing my voice. Uh, Hello, Russ. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. This is Chad. So I guess I just want to um, highlight what was is being presented regarding the capital improvement plan. So. If the council remembers during the budget committee, the, the discussion about the improvements to the system and the rates um, and what's going to happen over time, it's directly related to these phases. And that's why I was pleased to see the leap straight to the CIP. I mean, the CIP runs the whole system. It's going to run your rates for the next 20 years. If there's any single area besides ensuring adequate supply, you know, in my experience, this is where you want to, to focus um, to ensure that your construction schedule can meet um, the different phases that you have, that the phases are realistic. So sometimes, you know, if you have a phase that may be too big, um, you may have to have sub phases to, to do that. But, um, I just want to point this out to the council. Uh, a lot of times, this is really kind of the important stuff that you're talking about and future rate adjustments that you're going to have to deal with. It's because of these pages. Um, let me try. I, I'd like to add to that also, Chad, that, uh, that back in January, February, we had uh, uh, Deb Gallardi, uh, a consultant on our water rate. Uh, review. Uh, Deb used the the CIP from this master plan in her work as well. Uh, between that time and today, uh, we've added a couple of of components into the the master plan CIP that are related to seismic uh, some of the seismic uh, studies that that we're looking to do. But otherwise. Uh, we've we've taken these; they're incorporated into that rate review that we did earlier. Okay, 
other questions? Can I, um, the, can I just ask um, either Russ or Edward to specifically talk about the asbestos uh, wrapped pipes because that has such a large magnitude that's going to come into effect. Um, I think we're looking at uh, fiscal year 30 or 35, somewhere in that period. And I, I, quickly, I didn't, I didn't highlight it, but um, if you remember from Gallardi's presentation, there was an effort within five years to begin to set aside, to build up a reserve to address this. Um, so there's, I think, you know, thinking strategically and long term to start to build towards the replacing of those pipes. It's a pretty significant uh, capital project that you're going to undertake. And I think it's worth at least mentioning during the discussion. Yeah, okay. I, I agree. So so one of the introductions of, of where we brought Ed uh, uh, onto the city was when we had back in the early 90s, uh, maybe even late, uh, late 80s actually, uh, we had an outbreak of asbestos in the water system. We had to, uh, basically it was a don't drink the water uh, notice. We, we built uh, filtration systems around town in order for people to come and, and fill their, their uh, bottled water. Uh, so yes, there is a, a significant portion of our distribution system, as well as our primary transmission main from the well fields into the, the city that is, is asbestos concrete pipe. And uh, it's no longer uh, a pipe that you can buy for, for water use, but it, it, for, for us, it was all put in around the, the 60s into the early 70s. And it has a design uh, design lot, you know, we, we look at pipe with a design life of, of 50 years. We've, we've kind of approached that. I, uh, in working with uh, Ed and, and uh, during our rate study, uh, we felt that it was important that we begin to start setting aside some money uh, for the replacement of that pipe uh, moving forward. So there is a there is an appendix to the CIP that identifies uh, the the list of locations that we have AC pipe and the total cost, but that cost is not incorporated into uh, uh, the the CIP cost. But we did, we did in, in Deb Gillardy's work and the rate review process uh, in, uh, and I don't have the exact year, but we're going to start setting aside a, a small amount that will grow incrementally over the 10-year the, uh, rate window that when we get towards the end of this 20-year master plan window, we'll have a sufficient uh, uh, fund in order to begin that process of, of replacing AC pipe. Ed, do you want to ask, ask uh, add anything additional? Uh, yes, uh, your point is well taken. It was 1993 that we did the correction on the AC pipe. And I've always had a concern that the asbestos cement pipe uh, would eventually start degrading to the point where it would start uh, bursting. And that's the kind of leakage we get out of this kind of pipe is it doesn't leak in incremental amounts. It actually starts bursting when it loses strength. Uh, we did tests on it in 1993, which are included in the master plan to give an idea of what relative strength the pipes have. And I have no reason today to believe that uh, the correction the, the corrections we did in 1993, 95 are uh, diminished, diminished in any way. So I believe that the pipe has still retained most of its strength and we're in no hurry to do this, but I think it's a good idea to start sinking fund or something towards replacement of the pipe. Gallardi's rate plan that was presented, it's uh, both things are going to happen. There's going to be a sinking fund developed to create the reserve for income revenue that's coming in now. It'll go into the reserve to build up over time. And 
it's being built into the rate. So when it comes online to begin the replacement, it should the the rate component should be sufficient to be sustainable over time to continue the the replacement program without just relying solely on the reserve. If that makes sense. Thanks, uh, Councillor Sharma, and then uh, Councillor Belts had a comment in the chat. So I'll uh, Laurel, if you want to go ahead, and then Roxanne. Am I on? Okay. Um, it sounds from the report like you've done a pretty good job of mitigating that asbestos hazard, um, and that's still in place now. Is that right? Uh, um, yes. Okay, so since asbestos is not an ingestion hazard, it's an inhalation hazard, um, what was the Oregon Health Authority concerned with there, that people would inhale asbestos fibers through the mist and taking a shower or humidifiers? Yeah, actually, the, actually, the science is not complete on that. It, it does represent an immediate inhalation hazard, but the EPA has placed a limit on the ingestion level as well. Uh, the ingestion maximum ingestion level is 125 million fibers per liter, which sounds like a lot, but um, uh, I'm sorry, it's 7 million, million fibers per liter. At one time, Monmouth was up to 125 million fibers per liter. So it was well over the uh, maximum contaminant level, but um, that is more or less an advisory uh, limit because the EPA has not established a direct correlation between ingestion of fibers and a health hazard, but they still have that limit placed on asbestos cement pipe. Okay, so so with the inhalation, you've got issues related to asbestos, such as mesothelioma, um, lung cancer, um, Correct. asbestosis. Um, I'm just thinking that they're going in and ripping out those pipes, taking them out, and exposing whoever is doing it to the asbestos fibers, which would then be inhaled, might be more of an, uh, an expense than finding some other way of doing it. Well, the problem is that all pipe has an economic life and a limit to it. And most of this pipe was put in the uh, late 50s and into the 60s. So it's already approaching its practical limit on life. And uh, it's being replaced nationally uh, for that reason. It's, it's reaching its uh, end of its useful life. And uh, because of that, there are certain practices and safe practices that installers have to do when they're working with asbestos cement pipe. It's treated as a hazardous waste. and um, yeah, leaving it in the ground is not a practical alternative. It uh, has to be removed and replaced uh, with the new type of pipe that's being replaced with. So by the end of the master plan period, I project that the pipe would, by then will probably start incurring problems and would need to be replaced. Okay, and I'll, and I'll, just re I'll just reinforce that there, there are protocols both both uh, we have uh, protocols with our staff, but but uh, our contractors that we hire for for water projects uh, are required to have protocols as well for uh, mitigating uh, their employees' um, impact. Or, you know, uh, asbestos contact. Okay. Thank you. The, the I might mention that one of the main problems with uh, AC pipe, we, uh, what we call AC pipe, is that it um, tends to revert to a hard material that becomes brittle over time. And um, because of the past history of the loss of the asbestos fibers, we're not exactly sure what type of reinforcement is left in the cement component of the pipe. The master plan does call for checking some of the pipe, I believe in about 10 years. Um, so that we can ascertain just exactly what type of structural condition we're dealing with so we can head off any kind of uh, immediate problem. Uh, we don't want to get to the situation where the pipe starts breaking on us before we know it. <clears throat> Great, thanks. 
And Roxanne, did you want to talk back your chat on it? Well, I, I, I really I put it in the chat because I thought, well, we probably don't need to discuss it right now. But then I realized now it's not part of public record either if I just put it in the chat. So what I had suggested was I don't know if we have for as a city an environmental sustainability plan. Um, if we do have one, we ought to start talking about water conservation in that plan. If we don't have a plan, I think ultimately we probably should talk about having a plan, although last thing we all need is more work or the city needs more work. But I think it should be on our radar at this point because there's a lot of environmental considerations now we're talking about with you know, leaves and stormwater and um, lead certification for buildings and building city hall and water. And so let's put that on our radar if it's not already on there. One of the components of retaining water rights today by the state is that the cities and municipalities have to incorporate a water management and conservation plan into their uh, map water master plan. So as soon as the water master plan has been adopted and sent to the Oregon Health Authority, uh, there's a very good likelihood that uh, with the next review of water rights, that the Water Resources Department would uh, require the city to implement a water management conservation plan. Great, thank you for that. Unless there are any other questions, uh, again, the process here is that this plan now will go to the Oregon Health Authority, presented to us, go on to the Health Authority for their approval and come back to us for adoption. So we. Uh, oh, not, all this. Not, not quite. Oh, uh, the, the city has to adopt it. Uh, we'll make whatever corrections the city has to it. Uh, the city will adopt it and then we'll send it up to the Oregon Health Authority for their approval. So, Ed, so at, the uh, next, at your next council meeting, we'll we'll bring this back in uh, as a as a business item on the regular agenda. Uh, for your adoption, and then we would send it up to the health authority. Correct. Is it adoption, adoption by motion or ad, adoption by resolution? Resolution. It's usually by resolution. And what happens if the health authority has um, comments or corrections? We make the corrections. They very rarely do they make corrections to my master plans because I try to cover everything I can, but. <laughs> Uh, once in a while, they do come back with some comment, nasty snipe comment or something. But so <laughs> the reason That's I asked, right. it, was, it wasn't the mayor's fault. I I, I thought the uh, process was it went to the health authority first and then came back for our uh, for our adoption. No, so normally, then, yeah, it's normally not that done that way. It's adopted by the city and then sent to them. Okay, thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much for that preview. And we will uh, come back to this and gives us even more time to dig into those details. So thank you, Ed, for joining us tonight and sticking it out. Uh, I, again, I'm sorry. No, you're good. You are good. You were very patient with us. Um, I got to take a couple second break. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and offer the same to everyone else. Um, if we move to adjourn our regular session, uh, then we'll take a couple minute break and reconvene and us here. Okay, Ed, now your microphone's yeah, working now awesome. Be, yeah. So <laughs> now, now it's working. <laughs> now he can't hear us because he turned his speakers on. <laughs> there we go. Now we can mute him. Um, so, uh, move to adjourn the meeting of Mama City Council. So moved. So moved. And all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 I am like giving three minutes before we reconvene mm -hmm. as the Urban Renewal Agency. So, thank you all. <laughs> Okay, so I chatted to Janet and Elaine. You looking for me, Chad?
Chad, are you looking for me? Yeah. Oh. Oh. How long is the recovery now, on it already? You know, honestly, it doesn't bother you now. Probably the pain from before. It oh. starts to ache. Yeah. Do we want to stream urban?